I'm Kevin Matthews, Scottish film fan living in England, and this week, with it being our Crow special, there has been a lot of uh, feedback and negative reaction to the latest telling of the Crow story in cinemas, and I realised that they really shouldn't have put a stop to Luca Guadagnino's version of the tale, because it could have been titled, Call Me By Your Name. <laughs> Call Me By Your Name. <laughs> <laughs> oh god seriously how long have you been sitting on like how, we knew that this was coming for a few months did you write that like four months ago and just been holding on to it because that sounds I, like something it, it, it's it's been there it's been simmering on a low heat for some time and i am proud of myself dave proud okay no i'm proud of you too baby i'm i'm proud of you too little shaver I think I've got a genuine laugh at of this. Oh, <laughs> that was pretty funny. Yeah, I did laugh. Yeah, he cackled. <laughs> oh, I'm not gonna lie. I opened up my Google tab, wondering if that Luca guy actually did plan on writing and directing that <laughs> movie. So sorry, man. Um, I'm Tyler Hosley, and uh, this week we are not covering the best Crow movie ever, unfortunately, and that is City of Angels. So. It's unfortunate, but I can always talk about it again if you guys want to hear it. I'm Dave Gray, and this week I learned Tyler is a lying liar who lies. And this is Raiders of the Podcast. Yeah. Hey. Um, I didn't get too much extra watch because I was I was sick for a, a good bit of the week. Well, I was quarantined, which means I watched a lot of stuff, but like it didn't register because I was half asleep through all of it. But uh, the ones I want to talk about that I did watch, I watched The Disappearance of Cher Height. Um, which is a documentary about uh, American-born sex educator and feminist Cher Height and her um, her three major works, which were uh, or well four. I forgot there was the new uh, the Height Report on female sexuality, the Height Report on male sexuality, which is like if you ever stop and wonder, wow, how did things become so awful with toxic masculinity in modern society? Yeah, that saw it all coming. 40 years before it happened and men decided to destroy her for it. Um, it's, it's decent. Uh, height is an interesting person. It's a well-made documentary. There's some, uh, good interviews with people. Uh, the problem with it is the choice of narrator is Dakota Johnson. And she reads heights words in the same breathy intonation that height had which that's a nice touch except johnson is so unable to do anything more than that that she just sounds like she's reading cue cards while trying to do a jessica rabbit imitation and it's kind of sad and undercuts the natural charm and charisma of the actual person which you know that's a small strike against it it's just a quibble and nobody should talk to gene simmons as much as they talk to gene simmons in this like no one should just talk to gene simmons Ever. Ever. But it's worth watching. It is on um, it's on AMC Plus and I think IFC. It's worth checking out if you're even uh, mildly interested in the topic. Uh, the other big thing I watched that wasn't CROW related was uh, the Korean uh, thriller series The Frog. It's on Netflix. I totally recommend people checking it out it's eight episodes i think and it's about people who get hurt because of their proximity to something awful and it's 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 really good the cast is excellent uh the first three four episodes are all set up and the last four are all payoff and it is it is really good it is worth a watch you should go do it. Uh, besides that, I watched The New Crow. Um, did anybody watch The New Crow? I did. I did not. Oh, okay. So then. Sorry. I mean, I guess me and Tyler, we'll just save that for the end, right? I mean, we'll just talk about that later. It'll just flow in, right? Yeah, it's fine with me. All right. I mean, or we could just talk about it now. Yeah, I mean, it don't matter. You can do it now. Okay, let's want. talk about it now. Uh, I did not like the new crow, um, but not for the same reasons that a lot of the internet is hating on it. Uh, I'll say that the two good things about it were Bill Skarsgård and um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna I, 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 FKA Twigs. Yeah, 
Is that it? Okay. I can never remember the letters. I'm sorry. They're fine. I mean, and I know Tyler's going to disagree with most of the things I say, but uh, yeah, they're, they're perfectly acceptable in their roles. The problem with it is everything else. The script is bad. Um, I don't have a problem. I'm all for the idea of giving the characters a bit more of a romance, but the problem is there's no romance here. It is the most childish shit ever because the whole time frame is maybe a week. They meet in rehab. They break out. They party at three places. They fuck at those three places and they die. There's nothing there. It is, it is even more shallow than all of the crappy direct to DVD sequels. It's just like they had the time to do it well and they failed to. Then the action scenes are just dull as hell. The opera scene is one of the most generic and boring things I have ever seen. They didn't put a little bit of creativity in the action. It's poorly shot. The CG is atrocious. And the rest of the cast, especially usually fucking um, dependable Danny Houston, is awful. This is one of the worst villains in any film I have ever seen. The character is dumb. His power set is fucking stupid. It's just ridiculously lazy. It's like an idea that should have been discarded because they spent like 20 years trying to get this fucking thing made and nobody could come up with a good fucking villain in that time. It's it's terrible. Everything about it's bullshit. And then it's got a, a really shitty give us a fucking sequel ending, which is like it doesn't get the crow. And it undermines the basic mythology because instead of being about revenge, it's like, oh, it's all about pure love. And like his loss of pure love is gone before he's even a first fucking resurrected. Spoilers. Uh, you can skip ahead, but I'm going to spoil the fuck out of it. So Danny Huston's Houston's character can make people do things and he makes people kill others or kill themselves. So they go to hell now. I'm assuming that there is an all-powerful benign deity that's, you know, in charge of things. You'd think they'd be a bit more on the ball and understand that those people aren't responsible for what happened. But what the fuck ever? So we got, like, no moralism whatsoever. And then uh, they're killed, uh, Eric and Shelley. And they come to – Eric comes to and they're in this – I guess he assumes they're just, like, in a river. But instead of trying to save her, he immediately gives up. Now, how is that perfect love? Like, he immediately gives up. He doesn't even try to save her in the first four seconds. He just turns around immediately. So when he has his moment of doubt, which is totally unearned, and just bullshit so they can set up the shitty, stupid fucking ending, it's... And he does it twice. Like, that's not... So the crow, the avatar of vengeance, suddenly cares about perfect love, but he doesn't have perfect love from the jump. So how the fuck can you judge him for anything that comes after that? But whatever. Let's not even get into that shit. Uh, it's just it's corporate trash made by committee. There's no character. There's no style. It's ugly shot. Uh, I didn't know that it was directed by the guy. It was uh, Rupert Rupert Sands, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's one of the biggest hacks in Hollywood and the exact epitome of white men can't fail because everything he makes is absolute shit and it mostly loses money. I So why the fuck does he keep getting chances to make things like they could have hired any unknown director off the street and gotten a film that's four times better for a quarter of the fucking price? Uh, yeah, it's shit. It's just shit. And it's a shame. I went in. I went in so open and so ready to enjoy it myself, but no, I couldn't do that. It's like it went out of its way to fucking let me down. Is that spoilers done? No, yeah. I mean, I assume Ke uh, Tyler will spoil a little. Um, I'm gonna try well, not to. I'm gonna try. No, because I had my not. headphones off and then could just hear Dave's rant slightly winding down. No, no, I won't. <laughs> I won't, spoil, I won't spoil. I won't spoil anything. You don't have to put your headphones on for mine. Um, is that you, Dave? Oh yeah, that's me. Okay. Um, the only thing non crow related that I watched this week, I watched Incoming, that new Netflix coming of age like raunch comedy, uh, starring the kid from the Black Phone. It was cute ish, I guess. It. The oh, problem is, I saw that too. I totally forgot about it. Yeah, it's. 
it's not nearly as raunchy as it should be. Uh, I mean, it's got a couple like goofy bodily fluid moments of humor, like the hot drunk girl in, in the back taking a shit and all the shit like splattering all over the inside of the car. I mean, that's the kind of humor it is. And but that's just really as far as it goes with the humor. It's just other than that, it's just like goofy jokes here and there. The cast is fine. It's an OK one time watch. I just wish they would just go out all out with the raunch instead of just playing it cutesy all the time. But you can do way worse when it comes to comedy. So I say it's worth a one time watch. And that is about it for that one. Um, OK, um, before I state my thoughts on the new 2024 version of The Crow, uh, do you mind if I get this rant out of the way really quick, guys? It's gonna be oh quick. yeah, go for it. Are you, gonna, are you gonna rant in favor of uh, City of Angels now? No, no, no. I, I you heard my piece on City of Angels back when we did that episode. What last year was it? Last year, maybe last. No, year. But, I think um, that was that was that was twenty twenty one. I think twenty twenty one. Damn, was that long ago already? Fuck. I do love City of Angels. That is my favorite crow movie. But that's not the rant. I know nobody likes that movie except for me, and maybe Vincent Perez's mother. But um. Okay, I'm going to get this out of the way really quick because I know it's going to piss a lot of people off. So uh, let's just rip that Band-Aid off, right? Just rip it off. But at the same time, do I really give a shit about what people think about me? Not really, so fuck it. Um, the Crow, Eric Draven, is a comic book character. He's, he's no different than Batman, Superman, Punisher, Daredevil, Spider-Man, etc. Uh, other actors are allowed to portray that said character. But as we saw in the upcoming weeks, getting closer and closer to the new version of the film, the, the, the re-adaptation, I should say, the, uh, these whiny ass drool cup fanboys of that 1994 Alex Proyos adaptation, I put adaptation in quotes, I just, I wish they would take Brandon Lee's dead cock out of their mouths for two seconds, just two seconds, whip that dick out for a second. I mean, they would see that Dave is not included in this because Dave may have hated it, but he was actually looking forward to the new version. Me and him have me and him, me and Dave have had many conversations about the new crow. And now he was actually looking forward to this movie, but nobody is pissing on any graves by making another movie portraying Eric Draven. That's not fucking Brandon Lee. So all you mall goths wearing the cure and nine inch nails t-shirts. Stop cutting Brandon Lee's name on your arm for a second and go read The Crow Lazarus Heart because that is the best thing with the crow's name attached to it. And it doesn't even fucking involve Eric Draven or Shelley. I love Brandon Lee and I love the 1994 movie, but I'm not sorry for anything I just said. So I had to get that out of the way really quick. Man, sorry, we could have had an adaptation of The Lazarus Heart. Ah, uh, oh, or Carrare. Man, there's so many crow stories I could have fucking done. <laughs> there's tons of them but the problem is they're so deep cut nobody knows what the fuck we're talking about right now not a single person knows they just know eric draven as brandon lee that's it that's it which is a shame because there's a lot of good crow stories out there. i'm in the middle of reading one right now that's in that takes place in thailand and it is fucking brutal and it's awesome and it'll never be made into a movie but it should be because it's cool um I, Pr prias hasn't helped and unlike you two i haven't seen the new film and, and don't know where i'll land on it but i know it's already you know not done well in terms of box office no. and that's that's really annoying though just because of how smug and whiny prias has been about it when he's just been off a cliff edge for years and i'm the one person that kind of liked Whatever sword and sandals film it was that I made. Gods, gods, and, gods, and gods of Egypt. Egypt. Yeah. <laughs> well, but the, the thing about Proyas is he's a he's a piece of shit. He's a whining piece of shit who's spent the last forty years since making the crow whining about something. I mean, you got to remember, last time he was desperate for attention, he whined about SJWs trying to take down the movie um, Sound of Freedom, which, if I have to remind you, was about a man who essentially ran sex tourism and forced and got thousands of children around the world forced into prostitution because of the way his group operates. But, you know, what the fuck ever? Yeah, uh, fuck you, Alex Prius. That's, that, that's you know, I don't usually make policy statements, but that is now the official policy of Raiders of the Podcast. Fuck you, Alex Prius. 
you know, it's funny. I like Alex Proyas too. Like I, li- I like shit. Me and Dave were just talking about this yesterday. I, I love most of his filmography. Like I was just championing whenever we covered, I am, uh, I robot. I fucking love I robot and I love dark city. And it's just a shame. He's such a whiny bitch, but you know, whatever, whatever it is, what it is. But the crow fan base though, it might, Trump, Star Wars, and fucking Marvel is the whiniest fan base I have ever encountered in my entire fucking life. But that's a whole nother story. Um, the 2024 adaptation. I thought it was pretty great. I See, I loved the romance between Eric and Shelley. It's definitely... I see what Dave's talking about. It's definitely an angsty teen take on a romance. It's just partying, doing drugs, fucking, and getting tattoos. That's That's the romance in this movie. But I just, I kind of vibed with that. And I just, I love that they actually had screen time as a couple. Uh, and Shelly was an actual part of the story. I mean, she's in a, a solid 45 minutes of this movie with Eric. And she's not just an opening victim, which is something I appreciated for this story. Um, I thought Sarsgaard and FKA Twigs were both solid. I mean, and they had some decent chemistry. I just, I, I really liked them two together. And um I thought it kind of looked fine visually. Yes, it doesn't have the gothic look of the 1994 version, but that's fine. I didn't, I didn't really have any issues with the the villains. They're not as memorable as the 1994 villains. I will give you that. Danny Houston is no Michael Wincott, but he just he didn't bother me for what they how they wrote him. It's he was playing a more supernatural villain, and that's fine. Um. I actually, I'm on the total opposite end of the spectrum with the final act. I fucking loved the final opera house action scene in this. I mean, they dial up the gore by like 10. I mean, it's probably the most violent crow movie we've had. And they save all the violence for the very, very end. I mean, nothing violent really happens until the hour and 15 minute mark. Um, and that's when he finally puts on the crow makeup too. But um, I love that opera house scene. I thought it was really cool. Then like with the contrast of showing the opera scene on stage, cutting to all the fucking carnage and decapitation stuff. It, it was really cool. I, I thought it was. But um, if you don't like the movie, and that's totally fine. Like I just said, Dave isn't some crazy fanboy of the Proyos film. You know, I mean, I know he loves it, but he's not some fucking crazy fanboy of it. And he didn't like it. And that's fine. But most fans of this series have had their claws into this movie before we ever even saw a fucking frame of footage uh, before they even rolled, they even yelled action in the first scene of the movie. They've had their claws buried deep into this fucking movie. I say, just give it a chance. That's all I'm saying. If you don't like it, just move on. Other versions are allowed to exist. And that's all I'm saying. I said my piece. That was it. And it is like the eighth telling of the Eric Draven tale. So yeah. It's it's not like that it hasn't been done since. It's been done a few times. No, it's just people really had their fucking claws into this version for some reason. For some reason. Because they forgot they forgot about the TV series and the yep. two other comic versions. And this week we watched Oh no, it's Kevin's turn. Yeah. Just because <laughs> I didn't see the new crew. Well, you know why um, you, you were supposed to. I I know. You're supposed to be one of the it's, cool kids, you bastard. Well, I tell you, to make up for it, I actually rewatched the Crow City of Angels. And um, when we reviewed it on the show, I'm pretty sure we all thought it was bad and Tyler was championing it. And I gave it two out of ten. Tyler will be pleased to know I like it more now than I used to then. It has gone up to a whole three out of (laughs) ten. That one whole star, nice. Yeah, it's still very, very bad. Um, yeah, it's just, I cannot, just cannot accept Perez in that role. I don't think his performance is good. I don't think anybody's doing good work in that one. So I, I think the, um, like the, the, the cameos are really clumsy as well. Ian Drury and Iggy Pop. Um, yeah, it just, it's an odd film. Wait, and... Ian Dur- where's Ian Dury in that? I totally forgot he was there. He's the, um, is he the tattooist? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. shit. I totally, oh, like, he's I remember in, like, Iggy, He's in a couple but... of scenes. It's it's really weird. Oh, wow. Um, to- that means we did an episode where I kind of used Hit Me With Your Rhythm Stick, and I fucking didn't. Yeah, I, shame, oh, shame on you. I am so sad with myself. So other than that, 
uh, other than our crow selection, I also watched, uh, I finally watched Long Legs, which I really enjoyed. Did you two see Long Legs? I oh, yes. haven't gotten a chance you to yet. But you can, you know, I'll go go for it. I'll just, you know, mute you for a minute and I'll, I'll count to 20. No, uh, no, spot. I, I enjoyed it. I, I really enjoyed it. It's, um, I think it's quite enjoyably like unsettling and uh, interesting throughout. I just, the only thing I would push back on is, you know, there are a couple of moments of, yeah, Cage being a bit Cage. <laughs> there are moments where he seems very unlike his usual screen self. But there are still moments where you're like, well, of course, that's a that's a cage thing to do. That's a cage way to do that moment. So, yeah, Micah Monroe is great. And it's good to see her in a film that that really feels worthy of like her great performance. in it. Because I think it's been a while since she's had something that was like that good. You liked it, then, T. I absolutely loved it. It is my favorite film of the year so far. Yeah. But yes, I am a I am a huge huge fan of it. I thought it was incredible. Michael Monroe was amazing in it, and Nicolas Cage does go full Cage in places. The uh, the car singing scene, especially. But yeah. um, but yeah, I I love Nicolas Cage. I was fucking mesmerized by him throughout this entire movie. That makeup, everything was just yeah. He was great in this. Probably my favorite Cage performance in years. You know, uh, I, I haven't seen it, but Micah Monroe is always awesome, even in movies yes. I don't like. She should have had a better career by now. Yeah. I, yeah what I the agree. fuck, Hollywood? Yeah. I mean, that's that's what I mean. Let her the, make a girl you know, movie. A film worthy of her. And Alicia Witt is incredible in this. Like, it is <laughs> It is time for... the. I, I looked up her filmography when I was writing my review for the blog, and... Like she has been constantly working for the past couple of decades, but it's just that I think the the Christmas movies she's done, obviously they get guaranteed airtime and marketing. So you don't they are the they are the things that I've noticed her in. Not suggest an Alicia Witt Christmas movie special. I <laughs> will be broken when it's over and it's not I mean, I'll do it. Don't get me wrong. But I'm going to need some Gatorade and time. I mean, your first mistake was just putting it out there, Dave. I know. Yeah, so, I know. As soon as I said no, it, I was like, sense. I just damned myself. You cannot put that Alicia Witt back in the bottle. It is, it is done. Uh, I watched uh, Latitude Zero, which is a fun uh, submarine uh, monster movie. It's, it's not... It's not kaiju, but it was on my journey through, uh, you know, films that are of that ilk. And yeah, I I I really liked that one. It was silly. It was a submarine adventure movie with bat people in it, giant rats, and like a lion with wings grafted on it that's getting a human brain put inside it. But all done in a really strangely family friendly way. <laughs> Um, so yeah, like I really recommend that. Speaking of remakes that get people uh, all up in arms, and you know, if you like it, it tends to be a minority opinion. I still quite like two thousands bedazzled. I rewatched that uh, to write a review. Now I'm not saying she's the best thing ever, but I will say. I think I appreciate them casting Elizabeth Hurley more than them casting Brendan Fraser in this. Fraser's okay, but he's not, like, he's just not used to the best of his abilities, especially in the early scenes where he's super dorky and awkward, and it's really odd, whereas Hurley is always uh, fun and mischievous, and, you know, she's you know, playing on her looks as well and the twinkle in her eye. And she she works well in that role that would it would feel impossible to cast another duo who would be working in the shadow of Peter Cook and Dudley Moore. So I think Bedazzled is quite fun, but I think Harley is actually the more fun part of it than Fraser. And I know that many may disagree with me. There's an opinion 
I stand by. Uh, two to go. Ariel is an R film from Aki Karazmaki. And it's very good. He has a very dry, dark style. This is, um, it's, it's kind of a bit of a love story and a crime thriller and, um, s- slight road movie. Uh, very good. Highly recommend it if you like his uh, filmography. And then I saw Oddity, which is one of the, um, recent horror movies that's been getting some praise from Damien McCarthy who did Caveats and I really liked Caveats. If you like that you should like Oddity it's a similar uh, bless you Dave there you well, it doesn't it's hit similar... it doesn't hit here streaming until the end of September when it's going to be on Shutter. alright well, excellent uh, in time for Halloween month uh it's it's like a really good, <laughs> grim and dour and oppressive piece, but there is uh, quite often some dark humour running underneath each main scene. Uh, there are a couple of mannered performances that people may not like, but I kind of, yeah, I, I did really dig that, and I think it helped to, to make the whole thing a bit more uh, bearable because otherwise it could just be constant ratcheting of tension and uh, building of the oppressive atmosphere. It's, just, it's very well acted, very well constructed by McCarthy, and uh, hopefully you guys will like it when it hits there in time for Halloween. And that was me, apart from obviously lots and lots of COVID activity. Yay! Uh, this week, if you hadn't already figured it out, We watched the 1994 American Gothic superhero film, The Crow. The 2000 American superhero film, The Crow, Salvation. The 2005 American superhero film, The Crow, Wicked Prayer. And we rounded it all off with the pilot episode of the 1998 syndicated Canadian superhero television series, The Crow, Stairway to Heaven. So, uh, you know what? I'm just going to jump right in. Let's just start. Like, we're just doing, going to do them in order, huh? Movies and then the show, or should we just go yeah. random, whatever you feel? Sounds good. All right. And I'm going to just, I'm just going to go with the OG, the original, the one, the only, the 1994 American gothic superhero film, The Crow, uh, based on the comic series by James O. Barr. Directed by Alex Proyas. Screenplay by David J. Schowl. Scowl. I know I'm so sorry. I, I, you deserve better, man. Uh, he co wrote uh, Leatherface, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, and The Hills Run Red, and his uh, horror novels. The dude is like the godfather of splatterpunk. So I, I should have put more respect on your name, and I am so sorry because he is awesome. And John Shirley, who, um, well, I mean, you guys know who John Shirley is, right? I, I Songwriter for Blue Oyster Cult. Things. Yep. <laughs> yeah, he's a songwriter for Blue Oyster Cult. He's, uh, he's written a ton of books also. Um, not, he wrote the novelization of, uh, Constantine. That's like the only... <laughs> movie i i can think of that like i mean book that he wrote that i know you guys would know uh he also wrote uh the tv show defenders of the earth and he wrote for the real ghostbusters and deep space nine dude is a jack of all trades as a writer anyway it is about what happens a year after eric draven and shelly webster are murdered on Devil's Night in crime-ravaged, decrepit Detroit. Uh, one year later, Eric rises from the dead to uh, enact revenge against those that wronged him and his beloved. Uh, joining him are young girl Sarah, who is a buddy of Shelley's, and police sergeant Albrecht, who uh, his lu- uh, lust is not the right word. 
his desire to close the Draven case got him busted down back on the beat from being a detective. Eric hunts down 1010 Funboy T-Bird Skank and their boss Top Dollar. Um, I think it goes without saying that this is one of like if if we were to like sit down and list all the 90s movies that were like major moments this is very high up in the conversation this is this this is one of those movies that's got like an incredibly long shadow and it's up there with the matrix and blair witch project and uh, what other 90s movies are on their par i, I don't think uh, there pulp is fiction. Any. Pulp, pulp fiction yeah pulp fiction oh, or reservoir dogs so yeah. yeah so like those those movies are like We'll all be dead and buried, and it'll be 100 years from now, and they'll be talking about 1990s movies. And those are the movies they're going to talk about. And um, it's the first major feature by its director, Alex Proyas. It's not his first film. His first film is um, Spirits Spirits of the Air, Gremlins of, Gremlins of the Earth, which is actually really cool, and you want to check out if you have not seen it. Uh, especially Tyler, you want to check that out if you have not seen it. I have not. I'm definitely going to check that one out, though. Yeah, it, it's 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 a it's a good one. Uh, I, he might be a whiny bitch. That might be our official podcast platform, but he did have talent once upon a time. I don't know what happened with knowing in Gods of Egypt, and I'm not going to speculate. Uh, the cast is excellent in this all around. Uh, Brandon Lee plays Eric Draven in The Crow. Um He's he's great. I mean, let's let's be totally honest. He is great. He plays this character and Eric is not an easy character in the comic or in this. He says a lot of like ridiculous shit that you need to say earnestly. You need to be able to deliver with a, a bit of gravitas while also being a very sarcastic 90s character. And Lee does both really well and he can fight, which is. Something that only one other person that's ever played the crow can do. You'd think they're making an action series. They'd hire people who could fight, but whatever. But what really helps and boosts the original crow is the supporting cast. Ernie Hudson, who is always, I mean, he's always a dependable cast member. Ernie Hudson shows up. You know, you're going to get something good. He's Sergeant Albrecht. He's great. Michael Wincott as top dollar is fantastic. Dude is just evil as all get out. And I love him. Uh, Bai Ling is always great. Uh, Sophia Shinez plays Shelly and she's fine. She's underused, but like she looks really good in the gauzy white dress with, you know, the backlight billowing. So, you know, she does fine. Uh, Anna Levine plays Darla. She's fine. David Patrick Kelly is one of my favorite character actors. Uh, and as I mentioned last week, I just saw him on Broadway. He's great as T-Bird. His scene, he absolutely kills it in, in his later scene with uh, the crow. His delivery is it's just the way he delivers both fear and, and everything in that scene is so good. It is. It is an excellent performance in a movie where you don't expect such an excellent performance. Uh, it's a really strong scene, and it is worth pointing out. Uh, the The rest of the the gang are uh, Lawrence Mason as Tintin, Michael Massey as Fun Boy, and um, Skank is uh, I didn't write. Oh, Angel David, and I, I don't know anything else he's been in, but Mason and Massey were both. Uh, solid performers Tony Todd plays Grange Tony Todd is always great he's really good in this he doesn't seem to get much love when this is discussed but uh, myself and I believe you guys also and I know Craig definitely is we are pro Tony Todd here mm -hmm. Tony Todd should have been in more he should still be in more he is still up and running hire Tony Todd more thank you and John Polito is the pawn shop owner Gideon, and John Polito is also always excellent. So this movie didn't just, and it's something 
you can't really say about the others. It didn't just bring its A game for casting its lead. It brought its A game for everyone. Uh, it's well shot. The soundtrack is still an all time banger. That Cure song, even if they felt dirty and awful taking the money to record it, it's a great fucking track. The action scenes are good. Uh, yeah, this is this this is a good one. There's a lot of people that have said a lot of things about it, but the imagery is strong. The deaths of the bad guys are almost all they have meaning. There's a reason they don't go out the ways they go out. It's not just now here's and this is looking at you 2004 version. It's not just, hey, how about we do something that's been done before, like set a giant shootout in an opera house that doesn't really tie into anything oh that sounds like a great idea it doesn't fucking matter there's no reason for it except they want to do it in this it's all thematically relevant uh t-bird's death is directly tied to who t-bird is fun boy's death is directly tied to who fun boy is tin tin's death is directly tied to who tin tin is all of them have that moment and it's a really nice touch and it's something that I think City of Angels tried to do. It doesn't do it well, but they try to do it. And it's kind of not done in the rest of the franchise. But it's a really nice touch. Uh, I mean, the comics do it and the books do it. But I'm just talking about when I say the franchise, I just mean the movies. Because if we want to talk about the franchise as a whole, we'll be here way longer than Kevin can stay awake. <laughs> And I don't want to give him nightmares about some of the things that happen in the books. Uh, the Office shootout is fantastic. There are a couple, like I watched the 4K uh, disc from, was it Shout Factory that just came yeah. out? Yeah. Yes. That is gorgeous. There's one or two shots that are a little goofy, but the model work, it's one of those things where I never, like I've had the same VHS of this movie since 1995. Uh, and I have the DVD, you know, I got the DVD, but I never like I in this movie, I'm watching it. On, if I think about this movie in my head, I'm watching it on the old VHS that I eventually wore out. Uh, and it now stands on my shelves. I, I have a, a shelf of all my favorite VHSs that weren't destroyed by mold. And the crow is there. Um, and in my head, that that is what it looks like. But the 4K is gorgeous. The model work in some of it is fantastic. It's a good one. I mean, I, I I love this movie, and I understand that it is very much because of who I am and the age I am, but in a vacuum, it is a solid action film. Uh, you can understand why this would do well and why the success of this tragically eventually leads us to the MCU. Uh, I wish more were more like The Crow. I, I wish they'd take a, a little bit more risk and do something that is not expected in the mainstream at the time. But yeah, I give The Crow two thumbs up, man. It's it's good. Brandon Lee is fantastic. Uh, it's, it's an absolute tragedy what happened on that set. That, you know, it, it, it's a good one. It is worth watching. I understand why some people wouldn't like it, but I love it. It's an all-timer for me. <clears throat> I uh, I am a big fan of the Crow comic. I've read most of them. I read most of the novels. I just love the Crow as a whole. It's right there with the Punisher for me as one of my absolute favorite comic book characters. And uh, the 1994 version of the Crow is a fucking classic. I I've seen this movie so so many times. I could probably recite the damn thing from beginning to end without e without it even playing on my fucking television. I've seen this so many times. It's wonderfully gothic. The soundtrack is fucking amazing. The scene when Eric is putting on makeup set to the cure, that scene still gives me chills. It's wonderful. Um, all the villains are super memorable. Loved Michael Wincott as top dollar. That voice, man. That dude was fucking born to play a villain, and he's great. Um, the whole cast of villains are actually awesome. I, I love the scene with Fun Boy shooting Eric in the hand. And Eric looks through the hand's bullet hole while it's closing and just fucking laughing hysterically. That is such a fucking awesome scene. Um, it's paced really well. Ernie Hudson is great. Uh, it's got a great aesthetic. Uh, Proyos 
did once upon a time have a wonderful eye for visuals. Um, I mean, I would even say that Knowing has some great visuals in it, even though it's not the greatest movie in the world. I do think it's it's pretty to look at visually. Um, but yeah, and now to the topic of Brandon Lee, who who is amazing in this movie. I, I love his performance, and it's just an absolute fucking tragedy what happened to him making this film. I sometimes wonder if that said tragedy heightened this movie to a level that I don't think it would have been heightened to had that not happened. Um, I sometimes I wonder if it would have had the franchise this had, nor, nor do I think the fandom would have been as extreme as it is now, but that is a universe that does not exist, unfortunately. And, um, but yeah, the crow is great. It's a wonderful movie and I will love it forever. Even though it's like not my personal favorite crow film, I still think it's a masterpiece. Like I said, my personal favorite is City of Angels. Just for that, City of Angels was my first Crow movie that I've ever watched. That was the movie that I grew up watching. I saw The Crow after City of Angels, so it's just nostalgia reasons. But it's wonderful. The Crow is a fantastic movie and one of the absolute best comic movies out there. So I am a fan. Did I ever tell you that I dressed up as a Crow once? Did I ever tell you that I was the Crow every Halloween from 1994? Did 2010. Nice. I only, <laughs> I only did it once and it was probably about, I've got to say, like uh, 97, 98. And um, it was a Halloween party. My friend was like landlady of a pub. So she's like, we're having a Halloween party. And uh, I could get a black coat. I didn't have black leather trousers. So I wore my like shorts and then just wrapped bin liners around my legs. <laughs> Uh, black boots, obviously, black t-shirt, that was easy. Didn't have face paint, so just used paint on on my face. Oh, no. <laughs> White paint. No, no, I mean, there's no there's no tragic punchline here. It was fine. Oh, okay. When I was like, oh, my off, God, dude. I, don't, I can't recall what kind of it was, but when it scrubbed off, it was fine. And my ex-partner had, like, black lipstick. She'd had the goth face, so I used that on my eyes and my lips. And, uh, and it was great. I went out. I got a, a lot of uh, a lot of looks, a lot of people impressed. Went to visit my uh, dad who was staying in the next village. I was in a small village at the time. And then drove back. It was already dark. And uh, it was overtaking a car that was then trying to speed up just to, like, you know, not let me pass. So I was like, God damn it. And I, I looked over. And then they, they started to break and slowed right down. So I just kept on away. And I realized they've just looked over and seen someone looking like the crow just glaring at them in their car. So, <laughs> so they've immediately stopped and let me pass. And it was a, it was a fun night. Nice. I, I did but, it for so long because I own a black leather trench coat and I always have a lot of pancake makeup. I don't know why I always nice. have a lot of pancake makeup. I just do. It, it's kind of frustrating that I wish um, we had, you know, easier access to smartphones and everything photographed in, because I don't think there's any photo of that existing anywhere. I was living in the moment. But uh, to the film itself, I mean, I've, I've said that tale because, as you said, Dave, lots of people have said plenty on this. Uh, I, I love it. I, I loved it since I first saw it. I wasn't familiar with the source material um, I obviously did hear the, the tale of the uh, the tragedy about Brandon Lee. So it is one of those films that will always be complicated by that, whether it was a hit because of people then, you know, wanting to see the, the, the end result of the film, how it was completed, whether it would have been a hit. Anyway, people argue that, you know, Brandon Lee was, was poised for starting with this. It's, it's kind of hard to tell. It is a great performance from Lee. Um, I think early on, he, he seems a little less sure when he's sort of trying to bring out the weight of his character initially. But when he's really settled into the spirit of vengeance mode, I think he's great at that. He's got the the right mix of constant threats and the ability to play with his prey uh, when when he knows how things are, are going to go. So 
yeah, I think he's fantastic. And this, you know, for for genre fans especially, this is a, a stacked cast. Uh, Winkot is great, as you mentioned. Hudson is wonderful as the as the cop. Um, yeah, I I do get a bit irritated by the moment. It's like fire it up, fire it up, but <laughs> it is what it is. Um, but David Patrick Kelly is uh, yeah. As, that as moment, you said, it has seen as superb. That moment is so good because it sets them all up as individuals instead of as a faceless mob. Yeah, I, I just, mean, I, plus it introduces Darla. So, I uh, I don't mind. I don't mind it earlier on. It's uh, later on when it's oh, who's uh, who's the one that's bait? Is it Skank? Well, yeah, it's essentially yeah. bait. Yeah, when he's you know going a bit. Off the deep end, I, I find that a bit more annoying because he calls back to the fire up, and it's just the the refrain because they're bemused. But I think it's fantastic. And what I did remember to note this time was that the 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 driving, you know, incident, the the assault, the abuse, the murder. It's I think it's well done in terms of how it's shown and not it's not really dwelt on in a way that feels you know it's it's not too unpleasant but it's horrible enough to lay the groundwork for everything that comes you know it as being devastating because it is but also because of how the character is dealing with the memory of it and I like that. I think it's good. It could have been all done in quite a different way that would have been, I think, a bit more distasteful uh, be- because of the content and what happens. But I think that's good. Everything's just, I mean, it's pitched pretty perfectly. And, you know, they, they know what they're going for in terms of the visuals and the tone. And they just keep that going straight down the line. It's uh, it's it's great. Uh, I love it. I think, although I've not seen the new one, this will remain my favourite, unless there's some big surprise from the new one. There's not. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I really want. Like, I'm not gonna lie. I'm I'm, I'm going to say this a couple times this evening. I wanted it to be. I wanted to go in there. I wanted to walk out just like, wow, that was fun at the very least. And I couldn't. I walked out. I went with my sister, and I walked out. My sister looked at me. Don't take this the wrong way, T. But she went. Tyler's taste is questionable. And I went, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody no. sees that one. Yeah, they do. They do actually. That is that <laughs> yeah, a pretty common. That, that's thing. nothing new. Not, not nothing new. I know, but it's it's a new person. Generally, she's like, <laughs> "Dude, you're too hard on Tyler," and I'm like, <laughs> "You don't know." Shall I dive into Please. the Crow Salvation uh, from 2000? So uh, this is the film with Eric Mabius as Alex Corvus who is uh, sentenced to death for the murder of a young woman. But as he comes back, it uh, turns out that maybe he wasn't as guilty of murder as he would appear. This is directed by Barrett Naluri, who I don't think I've seen anything else from, although he's done a few things, including that um, Boy Swallows universe that people were enjoying. In the past, past year, so oh, yeah, he did. Miss Pettigrew lives for a day. You didn't see that? I don't think I did. Oh, no, because that's that Francis McDormand, Amy Adams, romantic. That's like right up your alley. I, I oh. assume you've seen it. So no, I I have not. And he did the Man Who Invented Christmas with. Uh, oh, I did see that. Dan with, Stevens. Uh, Dan Stevens. Yes, as uh, Dickens. Yes, and he uh, did the the the. Uh, he he was he was the series director on that. Um, uh, what's the, f- the 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 spy series? M I five. It's called something else in England. I, I don't remember what it's called in England. 
Oh, it's not. Um, it's not Spooks. Is That's it? it. Yes, he directed the oh. the film version and a bunch of episodes of that. Ah, oh, right. Well, I've not seen Spooks either. Uh, I did see Life on Mars. He directed uh, at least one episode of that, but uh, I'm not sure if that was the British version or if they redid it. I I think there's maybe only the British version no, for that. There's an American version. We don't oh, talk God. about that. We don't. Right. Okay. Don't, I mean, I, the, okay. No. To be fair, the American version is not terrible. It's just not as good. The ending's weird. But so is the original, so you know what it is. Yeah, I was going uh, And written by Chip Johannesson, who uh, also did stuff like 24, the um, home, is it Homeland or Homecoming? Homeland. Uh, some stuff for Dexter and Millennium. Lots and lots of episodes for Millennium, which is a box set still sitting in my cupboard that I've yet to work through. Millennium is Atlanta. awesome. Yeah, yeah I, I great show. It. Yeah, just haven't got to yeah. I, I, I quite enjoyed the cross salvation, and I don't know whether it's because, like, I knew what was ahead of me, and I just rewatched the cross city of angels, <laughs> or whether. Because it does help itself again by, like, by doing pretty good with the cast here. So I like Eric Mabius in this role. I didn't think I would, and I can absolutely see a lot of people being turned off by him in the main role here. He's so not exactly, bad. he's not exactly a typical leading man. Uh, he's not exactly really fitting for this role, but. They somehow make it work with him, I, I feel. And I, I, I liked him. He was much more, um, initially anyway, kind of, I mean, grounded isn't the right word, but I think it did seem a little, you know, more grounded compared to the other Crow movies in terms of the, the feeling and the vibe I was getting initially anyway. Because... It's kind of a, a murder mystery for a lot of the plot coming out. I mean, that's that's soon uh, clarified, but it's it's playing out that way. Other than maybe so, uh, Kirsten Dunst is in a supporting role. Uh, William Atherton is there. Walton Goggins, Fred Ward, um, Jodie Lynn O'Keefe. I mean, it's it's got a lot of really good faces and there are enough people that I could I could keep recognizing through some key scenes which helped because the actual plotting I mean it's, it's pretty straightforward but they, they seem to make it a bit messier than it needs to be jumping around for the because you know they think oh it's a crow movie it always needs flashbacks and you need everything being brought out in flashbacks but not really not not, not when they're, they're just doing that when actually they could have shaved 10 50 minutes off this runtime easily enough by just streamlining it a bit but i did i quite like this it's not um it's not on a par with the original but it's uh, it's certainly nowhere near the the bottom of the barrel with the uh, with these films. Um, yeah, I'm I'm as surprised as anyone that I came away from this feeling quite positive. I'm going to but... disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Please finish. I'm sorry. I, I thought you were done, but then you. you I'm sorry. No, I mean, oh. no, I mean, that's I'm I'm trying to. I'll try to end on some point that would still make me seem uh, sane and there <laughs> to have one. an opinion. There, 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 there isn't one. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't like this one. And I'll tell you why. A lot of it comes down to Eric maybe kind of sucks. He doesn't do the dialogue well. He can't do this kind of dialogue. And it, it, he delivers it poorly. 
And the fact that he has a stupid grin on his face throughout most of it, and like he does, he looks mildly brain damaged. Granted, he was just executed, so maybe he is, but I don't think he's supposed to be. Uh, I I have an issue with that. His performance is just bad. He can't fight. He can't deliver the dialogue. I don't get why they hired him. I just don't. The setup is so bad that they they rush a man from conviction to edu- execution in under three years. Now, I, I'll, I'll buy the crooked cops because there's a lot of crooked cops and there's, you know, bad things of due process. But like his lawyer should have at least been able to get him a decade worth of delays and, and you know, retrials because they didn't have fuck all evidence against this kid. Like they had no evidence against this kid. So, you know, but whatever, whatever. Uh, Kirsten Dunst probably gives her worst performance ever. Like she is just so checked out. She is just there to get a paycheck and she's acting like it. Uh, I will say there's, there's some good bits. Uh, William Atherton's always good. Uh, Grant Shaw is um, the lawyer and they don't give him much to do, but his like three scenes, he's fine. He's filler and he knows he's filler. Uh, the, I like the bad guys in this. Uh, Dale Midkiff, who is um, the dad in Pet Cemetery, and he was the lead guy. Do you remember that old TV show, Time Tracks T? I do. Yeah, I figured you'd be the only person that remembered it besides myself. He's one <laughs> of the killers. He's good. Uh, Bill Monday is uh, always a reliable presence. Um, I'm trying to think of what he's been like. He's one of those actors that's been in like a ton of stuff for almost my whole lifetime uh i think i think that the, the like go-to thing for for him would be um he's one of the recurring cops in the dead zone tv series and he's one of the deedles if you remember meet the deedles i do the paul walker <laughs> surf movie yeah another one where there's like two people that remember it and they're us <laughs> uh walter goggins walton goggins i'm sorry and i think this is like walton goggins first role or his second and you know it was it was filmed around the same time as house of a thousand corpses was so, it oh, okay. yeah yeah so i mean it's like you know like why isn't walton goggins the crow in this like you would fix a lot of shit if you'd switch him and eric mabius but what the fuck ever um tim decay is another one of the cops and he's another one of those uh actors that just pops up and stuff forever uh for folks to have a touchstone i guess his biggest like he's in swordfish uh he's in um god he's he's in a bunch of stuff oh okay he's probably best known he's in um he's in a bunch of episodes of party of five but he's also he's one of the lead guys in uh uh white collar that usa show with um ah crap matt bomer and got kind of popular again when it showed up on Netflix a couple, like a year or two ago. That's probably what he's best known for. And like, they're all the bad guys are a lot of fun, but tragically they're given bad deaths and they have to act against a crow who is just like, I, I have nothing against Eric Mabius as a performer. I think he's been better in other things. It's just, he's not right for this role at this time. Uh, he's, he was really good and welcome to the dollhouse a couple years earlier. He's fine in Resident Evil, which is, I think that was actually the same year, or maybe a year later. Uh, I think I would two, well, Tyler will know that immediately. Two, two years later, two years Resident later. Evil came out in okay. 2002. Yeah, I mean, like, he's fine in other things. It's just he's not right for this role, and the problem is, and this is also a problem with Wicked Prayer, if you have a bad crow, there's not much to work with. And again, I don't get why they hired someone who can't do the fights. The thing is, I don't like City of Angels. Like, it looks like piss. It wastes Mia Kirshner, who is, you know, a goddess among goofheads in that movie. But I understand, like, why you cast Vincent Perez. He can do drama. So, like, if you're planning on doing a lot of dramatic scenes, you hire him and then you teach him how to fight. The problem is they forgot to teach him how to fight with Mabius. They didn't teach him how to do anything and they didn't have a director that could get a performance out of him. And that hurts the movie too much for me. 
I, I think it's a shame, especially because they lifted a lot of things from the best crow book for this. Uh, you know, it, it's not the worst. I mean, that's the new one, but it's disappointing. I like the crow salvation. Um, now, let me say this, though. As Dave just said, the book that this particular story is loosely based off of, The Lazarus Heart, uh, that is fucking amazing. It's my, Like I said, it's my absolute favorite crow story that doesn't exist in film. Uh, so read The Lazarus Heart. It's fucking awesome. Um, but I don't count Salvation as an adaptation of that story because it kind of just cherry picks stuff from it. But uh, looking at Salvation as just a movie, I actually really enjoy it. Always have. Um, I like I don't mind Eric Mabius in this. I, I just I don't really have any issues with him here. He does have like one super awkward moment of dialogue that just always stood out to me. Uh, it's the scene when he is saving the two girls from the rapist cop. He like sees a flashback of the murder and he goes, you were there. I saw it. Yeah, that's exact. That's exactly how he delivered it. I think that was probably fucking horrible, but it's probably on par with how maybe maybe it's delivered it. Um, I think the soundtrack is great, and I'm not just saying that because it has a car chase set to the uh, Naked Exorcism remix of Rob Zombie's Living Dead Girl. That scene is awesome. Uh, I, I just I love the crow makeup in this too and how it's not really makeup. It's scarring from the execution mask. I mean, that face peeling scene is pretty fucking awesome with like the, the skin being like goopy, nasty all over the floor by his feet. So that's a really awesome face peeling scene. Um, I like the villains. Always awesome seeing Walton Goggins pop up. Fred Ward is always reliable. He's fine here. I, I didn't have any issues with Kristen Dunst either. I mean, she's playing a thankless role. I mean, it's just a role. She's fine in it. Um, I think it balances the tone pretty well. It feels like it's in the same universe as the Proyos film. It's it's obviously not perfect visually. It kind of looks like a TV movie, but I've I've always really dug the movie. It, it's fucking better than the piece of shit that follows it, at least. So, uh, my one complaint, I kind of wanted them to go deeper into that subplot involving the early two thousands internet fetish sex show that was underneath the fucking strip club. I mean, they showed that scene. And I just, I was like, please, I hope they go more into this. And they just never did, unfortunately. But that's just my own personal taste of wanting to watch sexual fetish stuff, obviously. But uh, yeah, I like The Crow Salvation. I think it's one of the better sequels. So, but yeah, I'm a fan of it. Is that me going to Wicked Prayer? Oh, yeah. Oh, don't stop. Nice. Come on, you can do this. Uh, the Crow Wicked Prayer. What is that from? Like two thousand five, I think. Yeah, two thousand five. Yeah, came out the same year as came out the same year as Hellraiser, Hellworld, um, and Deader. Uh, on his way to becoming an immortal demon, a gang leader orchestrates the murder of an ex-con and his girlfriend. Uh, Wicked Prayer is a big old pile of shit. Like I really fucking hate this movie, guys. But it does have two redeeming qualities. David Boreanaz and Tara Reid. Uh, they give their absolute best of what they're given to work with. And they're obviously having a fucking blast playing the villain here. Uh, David Boreanaz is, he's honestly pretty great in this. And it's a shame he's stuck in this fucking movie because he's actually, he's, he's mesmerizing on screen because he's, he's just having so much fun playing this evil ass role. And he's great. So is Tara Reid. I've always stuck up for Tara Reid. I think she's fine here. Uh, rest of the cast, Dennis Hopper and Macy Gray, they're fine. Danny Trejo is fine. The girl from Wrong Turn playing the dead girlfriend, she's also fine. She's really pretty, too, but she's also fine. Um, everything else is fucking garbage. Furlong sucks. He is a blank fucking slate who can barely emote to save his life. He's awful. He's just absolutely fucking awful in this movie, and I like Furlong. I've liked Edward Furlong in a lot of shit. I love him in Detroit Rock City. It's one of my favorite comedies. I love American History X. He's great in that. He's a lot of fun in Pecker, the John Waters movie. He's solid in Terminator 2. But he's so bad in this. He's just awful. And that crow makeup, man. Jesus Christ, it's fucking hilarious. I mean, he looks like a soccer mom who just discovered her inner goth with that sick choker necklace. It's fucking, it's hysterical. Uh, it's poorly edited. 
it completely wastes its new setting. I actually love the setting in this, and it's just fucking wasted. The action is horribly staged. That fucking bug light death is awful. Just awful. It, it's a terrible, terrible movie. By far the absolute worst Crow movie to date, ever. I don't think anything atop Wicked Prayer as being the absolute worst Crow movie. It's, it's not only the worst Crow movie, it's just a fucking awful movie. Just so bad. Why did you make us watch it? No, that was me. I mean, you know, we knew this was coming anyway, but I was going to pick this someday because well, I'll tell you later. <laughs> oh, man. Was that E.T.? It was. But I had to bite my tongue there because uh, I was trying to go for an immediate rebuttal because David Boreanaz is awful in this. <laughs> I <laughs> think <laughs> he's really awful. He's, um, uh, I mean, it's it's obvious what he's going for, the fun, over-the-top villain, and he just can't do it. Like, he, he can't do it in a way that is entertaining and, 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 like, lively and fun. He does it in a way that's really annoying and screams... Oh look at me! I'm giving this performance as a big fun villain. Isn't it a really great fun performance? Whereas, whereas it isn't. I kind of like Tara reading this because, um, like it's just a fun little role for her. She's quite cute in that role, and it's it's quite funny when things are going. Uh, sideways in the third act <laughs> she's um, really complaining that if things don't go her way she'll just end up like wasted and, uh, and I think I can't remember if she says that phrase but she basically refers to herself as trailer trash anything I, I'm sure she calls herself trash like if things don't work out with this plan Furlong is terrible and Whenever you see for a long being pretty terrible, which happens now and again, it it sort of serves as a reminder of was he ever any good? Like I I remember tolerating him in Terminator 2. And I watched Terminator 2 when I was closer to the age of Furlong. And I was still just like, he's he's not he's not a good young actor. Not that I could say anything because I wasn't trying to uh, show any acting chops myself, but I could still recognise that I, as a young age. I, I, I don't know. I, I do like Pecker. I do think he kind of works in, in Pecker. I, I'm not sure any of his other movie roles wouldn't be greatly improved by anyone else being in the role. And that that includes this. Like they should have swapped for long for Danny Trail. This would have been already ten times better. That's that's the movie they should have had. Um Trail just has a couple of scenes. He's alright because he pops up. Dennis Hopper is fun in his uh, his one or two little scenes. He he does help make this bearable and Macy Gray's okay. Uh I mean that's about it. I did enjoy watching this and playing the little game. I sometimes play my head with a Tyler pick of has Tyler inadvertently made us watch something racist? So doing the little checklist. I, I'm undecided. What did you land on, Dave? Oh, Wicked Prayer? That- um, it 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 flirts with it. it dev- like, <laughs> okay, so this is based on a book, and in the book, they... And it's a 90s book, so it's, you know, edgelord bullshit, but it tries to be more respectful. This just, this, this does not. They do not try to be respectful in this. Although it does some interesting things I want to talk about, though. So, I'll, you know. I mean, I'm surprised that Tyler doesn't love this more, though, because one of the uh, co-writers for this has a hell of a filmography for Halloween Resurrection. Yeah, uh, Cube 2, Hypercube Sean Hood Yeah, 
he uh, is he is the look, epitome of he's another white guy that can't fail. Just he wrote both okay. the 2011 Conan and the 2014 Rennie Harlan Hercules. No one should be able to write those and keep writing. I quite like the 2011 Conan in a way, but the Legend of Hercules, oh. the Rennie Harlan one, I gave that two out of ten. That's that's how bad that is. And I like the odd Sword and Sandals movie and I like Rennie Harlan movies. And I was just like, yeah, I'm done. This this is too bad, even for me. So that's uh that's a hell of a filmography he's got there. Um I i again, I think I'm correct this time in saying that I've not seen anything else from this uh, director, Lance Munger. I've not seen Six String Samurai, which I think was his Should. big breakout. Yes. Uh, um, I, no, as far as I'm aware, I've not seen that. As far as I can recall. Uh, yeah, this is like, this is really bad. And when it started, I did think, oh, cool. At least there's a kind of uh, Horseman of the Apocalypse thing going to be playing out here. No. That's that's just it's just names used at the start and and doesn't feel as if it's well fed into the plot. Uh, maybe I missed a couple of details, and you know it it works better than than I noticed. But I I didn't I didn't really notice that like paying off that well. It was just that's her names, you know. Because of uh, of these things, there you go, and that irritated me because I did think, oh, it's it's the crow, and there's got to be four horsemen of the apocalypse. That's going to be cool. It was not cool. No, I just <sighs> again I, this time around, I think I helped myself slightly by having. Rewatched the worst of the Crow films, although Tyler denies it. <laughs> <laughs> the Visapres one, because I was like, well, it's still not that bad. And I mean, I don't, I'm assuming folk who like Boreanaz will enjoy his performance. It annoyed me for almost every moment he was on screen. I thought it was terrible. I, I, I really can't recall the last time I so strenuously disagreed with Tyler on one point about a film. I thought he was going to say, this film's trash, but I don't mind this, I don't mind that. But when he was praising Boreanaz, I was <laughs> almost ready to just like explode in my chair. I think Dave might too. I think he might be surprised. I'm going to agree with hey. T. <laughs> what the fuck? I'm not just going to agree with T. <laughs> I'm going to say that I love all of the villains in this movie. You're assholes. <laughs> you are blind if you do not see how much fun uh, Yuji Akamoto is as Pestilence. You're just, I'm sorry. It's its true. You're just, you're just a little blind, buddy. Just a little blind, buddy. Are you done? Can I go now? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I... I enjoy Wicked Prayer. Um, yeah, it's got issues, and its biggest issue is Edward Furlong. Edward Furlong is very terrible. Uh, but he's not the like the real bad guy in this movie. You guys realize who the real bad guy in this movie is, right? It's Danny Trejo's Padre Harold. Because d- look at all the things he does. He gets uh, his daughter's Savior, the man who accidentally killed her attempted rapist, sent to prison because high school sports are more important th- to him than his daughter. Uh, he then gets his son to harass the boyfriend who saved his sister from a rapist for years. He okays letting a mine drain the lake, the only clean water his tribe has they tell us this he uh then oh you know turns a blind eye when the mine floods itself killing hundreds of native mine dozens of native miners the real bad guy here 
is Danny Trejo's Padre Harold. But you're not supposed to, like, pick up on that. All of the villains are that way because they were harmed by the mine. And Padre Harold's decisions. So, like, they're interesting ideas. Now, they don't use them as well as they should because the script by absolutely horrific writer Sean Hood and longtime crew producer producer Jeff Most. Jeff Most was also in charge of getting the soundtracks together for every film, which is why they reliably have good soundtracks. Guy is a terrible writer, but has a good ear for music. Generally. Uh, I like Tito Ortiz, the uh, boxer and MMA fighter. Uh, as uh, Famine, he's he's a little underused, but I think he's fun in it. Um, the Marcus Chong as War is fine. He's a pretty uh, reliable background actor. He was he's in the Matrix, and um, what else was he in? He's been in a bunch of stuff. Again, uh, Yuji Akimoto as Pestilence. How can you not love Yuji Akimoto in anything, dude? He's he's great. He's great. And we got to watch multiple Yuji Akimoto films in the past month. Do you remember the other one? Come on. Shit, I'm blanking. Kevin. I I do not. It's all, Better it's off all dead. a blur for me at the moment. Oh, yeah. Better off dead. Better off dead. Uh, I adore Dennis Hopper in this. Dennis Hopper's role in this is is amazing. Uh, Macy Gray's little bit is amazing. I don't remember. Uh, I'm brain farting on the actress, uh, but the the woman that plays the the preacher's wife. Uh, she's usually very reliable, and she's not listed on the uh, Wikipedia page, so I can't just go and pretend like I know her name offhand. Um, I'm going to look it up. I'm going to go down to uh, IMDb and, and wait for it to to load up very slowly. We've had some really bad storms. It's it's kind of made everything go really. Ah. Rena Owen, I should have known that offhand, is a fairly a reliable actress when she pops up in things, and she is excellent. Her scene in this is so good. So, I mean, tragically, she has to act off of Edward Furlong, who is so terrible. And Edward Furlong is really what drags this down. I think the villains are a lot of fun. I, I really like Tara Reid. I like her arc, especially at the end. Um, I enjoy David Boreanaz. Is he great? No, but he's supposed to play a white trash guy who's desperate to be evil. And that's how he comes off. I enjoy the shit out of that. Yeah, he fails at what he's doing, but I think he's supposed to. I think that's a purposeful choice. And I enjoy that. I like their devil themed uh, buffet. It's amazing. <laughs> it cracks Deviled me eggs. up. Devil eggs. Deviled eggs. That, that was kind of funny. Devil's food cake, deviled ham. I love it. It's so good. It's like this movie, like if they had somebody do another pass on the screenplay and they hired a better crow, like maybe somebody that could, you know, throw a punch on camera. Because, God, the fact that Furlong is just so incompetent that they have to film everything in like the worst way possible does not help. And it's it's a problem with Salvation also, because maybe it couldn't do the action scenes either. I... Don't get why you're making an action series and you keep hiring people who can't do action. Uh, but I think Wicked Prayer has bits. It, it, it's like Salvation, where I think there's moments that this could have been fun, but instead the producers just fucked up. But that brings us to our, our last one. We watched the pilot episode of The Crow's Stairway to Heaven. Uh, Mark Dacascos is um, excellent. I love Mark Dacascos. And he's really good in this. He can do the fights. He can do the acting. Tragically, the pilot is basically a really awkward Canadian TV remake of the movie where they make everyone very white, especially Tintin, which is a, a choice with how they dress him. Uh, that's it's yeah, it's it's a it's 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 iffy. It's 
it's really like all their choices in this first episode are really there's a lot of fucking iffy going on and um i am not going to talk about that (laughs) i am going to i am going to ignore it (laughs) because yeah it is it is it is it is problematic but it's the 90s tv so there was there's a lot of issues um but generally the the recurring cast is is pretty good the Coscos is really good as draven he can actually fight and they let him actually fight uh mark gomez is uh the cop albrecht and he's fine for a tv cop in a syndicated show in the 90s sarah moore or i'm sorry katie stewart plays sarah in it she's fine uh, tragically, you don't get to like a lot of the other recurring characters. Like Kadeem Hardison's Skull Cowboy doesn't show up until I, I don't remember, like episode three or four. And uh, I've said it, I've said it a bunch, but one of the best team ups in TV or in, in 90s movies are, are Kadeem Hardison and Mark Dacascos. They play well together. They play off each other well, and the fact that they were not a bigger combo when fucking Tom Arnold was appearing in every other action movie is, um, I'm trying to think of a good word for it, just kind of bullshit. Honestly, it's just kind of bullshit. I had to watch Drive again this week after watching this because I love them together, and Drive is a blast. Uh, but the crow, Stairway to Heaven, is good as long as you don't watch the pilot episode that we watched, which is just kind of goofy and awkward. I mean, like later on in the series, um, John Hawks shows up as a suicidal stunt motorcyclist that needs to be saved. Corey Feldman shows up as Eric Draven's brother, Christopher Draven. And Anthony Michael Hall plays a serial killer. Yep. I mean, the later episodes are a lot of fun. <laughs> Tragically, we we watch the the pilot, which is just it exists. It's it's very Canadian TV, and I I don't want to say anything bad about it because I do enjoy the series. And I think folks should look it up. Uh, there's a really nice fan upscaling of it out there because it's not streaming anywhere. So I don't mind you know pointing you gently in the direction of other sources. Um. But it's a fun series that tragically it got cut because uh, Polygram, who made it, was sold to Universal between seasons. And they just decided to shit can like a lot of the syndicated TV stuff they did. And it it was a victim. They almost did a TV movie to uh, wrap up the storyline, but there was a rights issue. They got that cleared up. They were going to do a... Uh, uh, a six episode mini season two, but again, Universal at the last minute decided they didn't want to bother with it. So sucks for us. We could have had more good crow, but instead, you know, you, sh- you should look for it. it. It's a fun little show. Uh, you should also look for uh, uh, Blade the series, which I watched this week while I had to quarantine. Nice. Yeah, I liked it. I liked it. That, that's on you guys. You guys talked me into it. That was that was fun. Sticky fingers Sticky. is a solid blade. He is. I was, I was shocked. I was really surprised. That dude can act. He just never gets the credit for it, but he can fucking act. Solid rapper too. Super underrated. Um. Uh, Stairway to Heaven is a, it's a syndicated TV series made in what like 1998, back when they didn't put any money into television series is so comparing it to actual films that's kind of unfair but for what it is i think it's good uh, i remember watching this all the time back when it aired on the sci-fi channel around like 1999 and 2000 i mean it constantly played there along with like the highlander show and stuff that's where which i watched I also, it too yep i also really like the highlander show it's a lot of fun same production quality as this so um but this show, well, this pilot almost, it, this is almost a direct retelling of the Eric Draven and Shelley story. But instead of adapting the comic, it's pretty much a television recreation of the Proyos film all the way to the 
fucking window in the apartment building looking exactly the same. Um, internet wasn't a huge thing back then, and I'm pretty sure not a single soul bitched about this the way they do with this new 2024 film. Oh, whatever. no, they I'm did. That they, did they, they really? They did. I was, I was an internet kid in the late 90s, and those message boards on AOL were not – I mean, that's how I first learned about it. Oh, okay. Cause, okay, okay, that makes you feel better, actually. Yeah, no, they they were they were upset, but I was a DeCostco's fan, so I was there. Yeah, boy, I stayed home. Man, I, I don't want to talk. I, should I admit that I used to stay home skipping school for certain all-day marathons on the Sci-Fi Channel? I mean, I would. Fuck yeah, I, I did, I did, and that was The Crow. I, I did that a couple times to watch the whole series. I'm, I'm not proud. I am proud. Fuck you, school. I still have the VHS tape of this uh, in my shelf right now. It's they they released the pilot on VHS, kind of made it look like the uh, like a, like it was a movie. Like they try to sell it as a movie. Obviously, it's not a movie, but you know they try to sell it like that back when they hit VHS. But um, but yeah, I, I'm happy to hear that people bitched about this in 1999 and 2000. I, I wasn't really on the internet yet. That was like nine or ten, but I got around. I got around like 2001, 2002, and people just didn't care about this show around that time, so it was over by then. Um, Mark DeCosco is fucking awesome. I love him, and I, to be honest with you, I think he's just as fun as Brandon Lee in the role. He delivers a really good performance in this, and he can fight really well, too. The fight scenes are fun. Um, I think the girl that plays Sarah is actually a better actress in this one than she is in the original. Not that I dislike the Sarah in the original. I just think the one in this show is actually a little bit better of an actress. She's she's pretty good. But um I've seen the show multiple times over the years. There's an episode where Eric works as a bouncer in one episode, which means that fucking bird brought him back from the dead to work a nine to five. And I say fuck that shit. If you're gonna bring me back from the dead, I'm not working. I'm telling you that right now. It ain't happening. It's a fun show though. Um if you haven't if you haven't seen the show at all i recommend it the pilot's definitely the weakest episode um but i recommend the show uh the dvd is going for like 200 dollars now which is weird but um if you can find it on like itunes or something for cheap check it out it's, it's worth the watch i kind of feel bad that i didn't have time to to delve into more of the series but I I didn't mind this pilot. Uh, it is yeah, just a, a retelling of the story. But uh, I certainly share the love for Mark DeCascos that uh, you guys have. He's he's good in this. Yeah, um, he he brings it. Um, yeah, I, I agree with T in relation to the young girl as well. Uh, Sarah, played by Kate Stewart, I think uh, she was really, really good. The rest of the cast are all just fine. I mean, I don't think they really compare as favorably if they have counterparts in the movie. Um, Mark Gomez is okay, but he's not Ernie Hudson, you know. Uh, but he's he's all right with with what he has to do. I don't. Know. I mean, there isn't much to say about real is that. You guys haven't said already. It is, you know, it's a late nineties TV show working with uh, that kind of budget limitation and the many resources of Canadian TV production opportunities. Who was the uh, the the guy was familiar the the sort of upper Baddy. I don't know if he remains the upper body for the series. Uh, you know what I mean? Who was in the um was was he in a wheelchair? I can't recall. Uh he's not in a wheelchair, but he is sitting down a lot. Is he maybe right, he is so. in the end, but yeah. Um he's in stuff and I'm I'm brain farting on what it is. It's uh He he is, yes. He's um I I really it's annoying me because when he first appeared, I thought of he's he's a uh, Jason Piper Ferguson, and he is in um, 
uh crap he's in um adventures of briscoe county jr he's in the last ship he was in uh caprica I, i'm trying to remember like he's one of those guys that's been in like a ton of stuff since he's in prom night 2 he's 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 the guy in, he's the kid in prom night 2 i think he's in unforgiven also like he's in like a ton of shit Hold on. Okay. Yeah, my phone is. Slow. Okay, there we go. My phone just finally pulled up his IMDb. Dude's in everything. He's in X Men: The Last Stand. He's in She's the Man. I think when he first appeared, I know I, I know I'm wrong now, but um, I initially thought he was the. God, I'm forgetting his name. Is it Greg something? Greg Henry. Greg Henry, who's uh, the the mayor. In Slither. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 He's he's got a similar look, and then I was like, no, it's not him. And he's been in, like, I think he's also been some, like, action movie buddy. He doesn't have the build for it, but I thought he'd been opposite an Arnie or Stallone at some point. He's got that um, ability to be that that strong a villain. He's the bad guy in Bird on a Wire, the Mel Gibson movie. And uh, what else? He's in a bunch of stuff. He's in Pin. Pin is so much fun. We should do Pin. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've seen I've seen Pin. And he's the villain in Drive with Mark Cascos and Kadeem Hardison. Oh, oh there you go. <laughs> that, I was waiting for you to think sense. of that one on your own, but I was just I was just letting <laughs> no. it go. I was just I was waiting, I was waiting. I thought it would click, but then when it didn't, I was like, I need to tell him now. No, uh, no, no idea. Uh, that's that'll be how I was thinking of him as a as a villain against somebody capable of uh, of really kicking his butt. Uh, and uh, Julie Dreyfus, uh, be honest, reminds me of um, a tale I had uh, someone tell on a podcast about uh, thinking that. When she was being mentioned, the person just meant Julia Louise Dreyfus, <laughs> and because they knew her so well, they would just call her Julia Dreyfus, so they didn't uh, they didn't recognise that extra that actress. So at least I was on the lookout for her. Now, uh, now that I recall, it's a different person from Julia Louise Dreyfus because I would make that mistake as well. But it's it's okay. This is. Um, I'm guessing this is just, you know, the that sets up everything for the show ahead and it looked like it was a was that a twenty one, twenty two episode season? Yes. Yeah, it was syndicated in the late nineties, so like if I had if I had way more time to kill and uh you know, if we were planning months in advance, I could have quite happily been forced to to watch more of this and see how the whole show panned out, but I just didn't. You know, we're doing this for for this week, and I saw enough that I I liked it. It's quite um quite hampered by the you know by its obvious small screen limitations, but I mean, there's some good stuff. Maybe we should do that. We should plan it so when they do a. They finally put it on Blu-ray. The last us to do commentaries. We can establish ourselves as the experts in the Crow Stairway to Heaven. I'm just throwing that oh, out there. No, no, because that'll cut into our Alicia Wick Christmas special time. Oh so. yeah, shit! Uh, I'm gonna can't. so regret that. <laughs> oh my god. Oh. Uh, mm. What? What oh. else is um, a highlight? Was actually him going. To the um, office, the the staff there just try to be like they try to be all smug and standard, you know. Oh, we've got someone here claiming they wrote a song, and uh, Dacascos being very uh, upfront about, yeah, yeah, I died and seem to be here again, but <laughs> that's my song. Uh, I really like that. I like that uh, little strand of him knowing that his song was taken as well. Uh, I know it's just a little thing, but it was uh, it was enough of a step away from the familiar story of the first movie. 
and uh, I thought Dacascos played it well. He plays the whole thing well, uh, and as Dave said, like it's someone who's capable of doing the the fight moves, and that that really helps when they're doing a couple of scenes with the physicality. Yeah, I I quite enjoyed this. Um, I'm pretty sure no or few other podcasts have spent this much time talking about it. But that's that's us giving people bang for their buck. Or is it a crow special? Is it bang for their beak? <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, it's time to pick one. Now, from, really? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's the first one. It, I mean, it's obviously the first one, but it, it is this what we agreed to. So, yeah, it's time to pick one. Yeah, it's the first one. City of Angels. I'm just kidding. It's the first one. Say, I, I knew he'd do that. Uh, you can find us on the gram uh, where we're Raiders underscore of underscore the underscore podcast. You can find us on our blog spot, Raiders of the podcast Uh You can find us anywhere you get your um, podcasts. And if you really need to talk to us, you can email us at Raiders of the pod at gmail.com. Did I ever tell you guys about the time I met James O'Barr? No. Okay. No. So it was like 95. It was, it was before City of Angels came out, but after the, the first movie came out. And he was doing, uh, I, I, he was just doing a tour of comic shops, and he came to my local one, uh, Brainstorm, where uh, I had I had a deal with the guy Dan who owned Brainstorm, where uh, I would get magazines, stripped magazines and books from the bookstore my mom and older sister worked at, and I would exchange them for the even amount of value of stripped comic books. So I have a ton of stripped comic books still. And um, I, once, once, a, once a, every two weeks, we'd, we'd exchange. And uh, I went in, and yeah, I was going back that night for the signing, but James O'Barr was already there. Like, I guess it was like 1030. He just hung out all day, just talking to people. Dude was awesome. Just really nice and approachable and just, I, I think I hung around. I hung around for like two hours just talking to James O'Barr. And remember, I was like 14, 15 at the time. So I, this was probably like the only time in my life where I've been truly awestruck by someone. Mm-hmm. So um, we go back, I go back later that night and I'm with my younger brother and we're waiting in line. And my mom decides she wants to join us after a, a while in the line. And his tour manager was an old Jewish man. And for some reason, old Jewish men love to sexually harass my mother in the nineties. <laughs> So, like, he said the most disgusting things to her. But whenever they did that, we usually got free stuff. So I got a bunch of free crow posters and and <laughs> sketches and stuff signed. Uh, one of the posters still lives on my uh, on my office wall. Nice. So you know, it almost makes the the emotional abuse from my youth worth it. The the fact that people treated my mom terribly. You know, there's a lot of bad things in the world. Anyway, thanks for joining me, guys. Thanks for listening. Whoa, 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 Dave. <laughs> we forgot to mention the picks for next week. Oh, Dave. I'm yeah. sorry. You're right. I I was so focused on the crow. Uh, well, it's a normal week, and it's you guys' turn. I think that's just it. After after four crow movies, I just I don't think I can face a Tyler pick. So what you got first, Dave? <laughs> um, we are watching the 2019 coming of age A24 film, Waves. Wow. Uh, I pick my films for many reasons, and sometimes I pick them specifically for Tyler. Sometimes I think it'll be fun to torture Tyler. Sometimes I like to push Tyler towards a film that I genuinely hope he will appreciate. So I have gone, at last, for 1999's A Room for Romeo Brass. Oh my! Why? Why? After all the crow stuff, why would you be nice to Tyler? Well, I the other side of that equation is that I'm kind of being nice to all of us. Hopefully, as always, thanks for listening. Thanks for joining me, guys.
I'll talk to you next week. See ya. See ya.